leave this moment, don't leave this space where you're standing. This is like shooting fish in a barrel right now. I don't want to miss this. Jesus. What I want to ask you pastors is, is he worth making a change in your life? Is he worth your tired? Is he worth your desperation? And is he worth your change? I know this God that right in this moment just I is them. In my particular tribe, what we desperately need is to say, God, God, you are worthy of our repentance. You are worthy. You're worth more. You're worth more. You're worth more. Jesus. 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 You are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy. What I see, what I see is Jesus standing at the top of that hill, looking out over Jerusalem, and now looking out over you saying, oh, how I have longed to gather you, to gather you. You just, just picture it, Jesus, all the angels above us right now, and, and his wings just covering us right now. There's no condemnation. There's no judgment. Just pure love. The heavens are open. The heavens are open, my friends. The heavens are open. You gather us up, and you love us so dearly, and we thank you, Jesus. You are worthy. 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 All honor and glory is yours. Lord Jesus Christ. All honor and glory is yours. Come, Holy Spirit, and fill us now. As we open the word and treasure the word and hear your commission again, God, I pray that we would hear it with fresh ears, a fresh heart. God, do a new thing. I would just ask you to close your prayer with that. Just is in a very personal way, ask the Lord, do a new thing in my heart, Lord. Do a new thing right now in me, God. Do a new thing. I don't want to go home the way I came. Do a new thing. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Man. It's just so good, isn't it? It's just so good. Because I'm a pastor, too, and because I have come from um, staff issues and short weeks and too much other stuff going on in my life. I know what it feels like, and I want to say to you who are pastors, uh, it is, it is a, a grace to your people that you've decided to be here. And, um, and it is so much grace on us as pastors that Westgate gives us this. Amen. So I want to say thank you to the Westgate staff, and I really want to say thank you to pastors uh, Alec and Rita Rollins. They have let me be part of their family. Me, a Southern United Methodist, 
I, I, they should have checked my ID at the door. <laughs> they have let me be part of their family, and I'm so grateful, so grateful to y'all for inviting me into the Westgate family. So grateful to you guys for being here. So grateful for you giving me time to share with you from my heart. I want to say about a little something about what happened with Cheryl, the woman that Pastor Alec just told you about. Two or three years ago, I, I have been in Luke chapter 9, I just got obsessed about 10 or 12 years ago. I've been in Luke chapter 9 for years, years, just over and over, reading, studying, listening. And uh, that's what the material is about that's there in the, in the bookshop. Book shop. It's about Luke chapter 9. And I'm going to give you one guess about what I'm preaching about today. Luke chapter 9. Um, but somewhere two or three years ago, I was just really frustrated. And um, you know, I don't know, if you, if you know anything about the United Methodist Church, you know we're in deep, deep crisis. And I'm not, um, I'm in the let's get out of this, you know, whatever it takes, or shoot me, Jesus, whatever it takes, just get me out of this. Um, same prayer I prayed when I was in seminary, <laughs> ironically. Um, but, uh, but, but I, so about three years ago, I was just one of those desperate places. We, our crisis really mounted. And, um, and, I, and something that I've become very aware of is that most of our tribe is just good social work. And so I said to the Lord one day, and I know you're not supposed to do this, please kids, don't try this at home. But I, I said to the Lord one day, you know what? I am no longer satisfied with third person stories of miracles. I'm not gonna be satisfied anymore. It does not do for me to talk about the people in Africa and how wonderful things are for them. I, ain't I a Christian too? <laughs> and I just said, you know what? I'm not talking about it anymore. If you want to show up in my own life and my own ministry, awesome, God, but I'm not talking about them anymore. I get that they are doing amazing things, but I'm not satisfied with third person miracle stories anymore. People I've never seen, places I've never been. And so I started praying for God to show up personally. And uh, I've always had a, a little bit of a gift for inner healing. And I've, and I've seen many healing stories inside my church um, in, in inner healing, especially with women. And that's where we were that, last, that weekend last year when, when the women of Westgate got together and we were doing this inner healing work. We actually had a moment where I, I had the whole room just uh, uh, do inner healing prayer together. And Cheryl experienced tremendous healing. I didn't really know her in the room. She didn't distinguish herself even after the healing, but I'd heard that she'd gone home uh, feeling a little bit like a free bird, you know, just, and told her husband, boy, this, I got some incredible healing from her childhood wounds. Went to bed that night, slept more peacefully than she'd ever slept, and, and woke up the next day and realized her eye had been healed. And I was here, I was preaching on Sunday morning, and she came up first thing in the service, and, and, um, and she brought her, on her way down, she handed me her little disabled car thing, said, I won't be needing this anymore. So I ran home to my people, and I said, it works, it works. If you tell God you're only gonna do first person stuff, He'll show up eventually. Sort of like the guy who said, you know, you keep beating your path to God's door and he'll just say, do something to get you out of there. And I was so excited. I was so excited. I kept in touch with Cheryl every once in a while, checking in. Is it still there? <laughs> I'm about to tell it again. <laughs> and um, I was in the hallway when, when we got here and, I, and Cheryl saw me and she came and we hugged each other and she had tears in her eyes. She said she just had, she just had her checkup after this, um, like a checkup for her eyes. And the, and the physician said, your eyes, that eye, he said, usually after you've had a stroke, there's some clouding, but your eye looks like a pediatric eye. That's incredible. And I've never had anybody, even when I was a child, say my eye looked like a pediatric eye. <laughs> pediatric brain, maybe, but not a pediatric eye. I just want to say to you, I, I think there's a place. I think, maybe this is just me, and y'all are welcome to listen in. 
But I think there is a place for saying to God, I want to see you move here, here. And I don't want to manufacture the stories, you know? Because I've been at my church for 16 years. Anything I walk back with, they're like, yeah, right. I never see you do it here. So I, I better know what I'm talking about. And, and, um, and, and so I've just decided, God, first person stories only. Two months ago, same exact kind of retreat, same kind of inner healing. And a woman got healed of hip pain that's been there for decades, decades. And I was in the room with her, so I can tell you about this. Two weeks ago, a woman who was not a believer came into my office, and Jesus showed up in my office, healed her, and then she became a Christian. Yeah. Which, is, which is probably a really smart thing to do after Jesus is just healed. <laughs> so I wanna talk about what the commission, the commission of Jesus. In Luke, it takes a little runway to get there. In Luke chapter four, Jesus stands up in the temple one day and he announces his public ministry. He unrolls the scroll to Isaiah and he reads this. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That is a bold proclamation. This is Jesus standing in the authority of the Holy Spirit, staking his claim as the first apostle and prototype of the good news. Yes, Jesus was and is an apostle. The term in Greek literally means sent one. And according to John, that is the phrase Jesus uses most to describe himself. 42 times in the book of John, Jesus calls himself the sent one, sent by God, sent to save the lost, sent for the lost sheep of Israel, sent that they might have life, sent to give good news, sent to earth by the will of God the Father with very specific marching orders to reveal the kingdom to the poor, the blind, the oppressed, the discouraged, those who never knew they had the favor of God. In Luke 4, he sits among his people, and Jesus cast his vision for a radical change in the spiritual climate, and then he gets sent out to proclaim the kingdom, to display it. He drives out multiple demons, he heals quite a few people, he calls favor down on a tax collector, a few fishermen, and some assorted other misfits. Give me an amen if you're a misfit, amen. or if you're sitting next to one. <laughs> who are invited into his inner circle to watch and learn what it means to be the sent ones. Now that's Luke chapter four is where he opens the scroll. Everything from there to Luke chapter nine, he's modeling for his followers what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And then in Luke nine, there's a shift. Jesus recasts the vision, but he does it this time by way of transfer. He pulls the, ch the 12 together, and then in Luke 9, chapter, uh, verses one, 1 and 2, I want you to hear this. He gave them power and authority to cast out all demons, to cure all diseases, and he sent them to proclaim the kingdom and to heal the sick. That is quite a calling for a bunch of misfits. Amen all by myself. These guys are told they have both the authority and the power to do what they'd only seen one other person do and that person was so amazing to them that they assigned divinity to that man. It must have been stunning to be told they would be sent out with that expectation. They would become the culture changers. They would welcome and advance the kingdom of God by bearing fruit in their sentness. That's the first work of the 12 who we call apostles, the sent out ones, cast out demons, cure all diseases, proclaim the kingdom and heal the sick. I believe my friends, that is what it means to be the New Testament church. This is what it meant then, 
And this is what it means now. Listen, when I read in my Bible what Jesus what called first priority sending, this is what I hear. It is to fight the powers of darkness by bearing the light of Christ to people who are demon possessed, who are oppressed, blind, hurting, who need healing both inward and outward. And all of those things connected with the proclamation of the gospel, which is to say, cast out demons and proclaim the gospel. Cure all diseases and proclaim the gospel. Heal the sick and proclaim the gospel. If you do the first without the second, you're just doing good social work. If you do the second without the first, you are not fulfilling the kingdom mandate to see people get, to, get back to the other side of Genesis 3. So he's given them good theology in these two verses in Luke chapter 9. He's given them a supernatural ministry. Let that sink in. When Jesus defines what it means to follow him into the world, he says, this is what people who believe in him do. They are sent out with power and authority to cast out demons, cure disease, proclaim the kingdom, and heal the sick. And yet, when I look in my, I'm in the Bible belt. I'm the belt buckle of the Bible belt. (laughs) My county literally is the birthplace of the Southern Baptist Convention. Imagine being a spirit-filled, conservative, female, United Methodist pet church planter in that world. <laughs> Most of what I see that passes for church or passes for Christian in my world is a blessing before meals and an hour in church. And that's how we define ourselves as Christians. But when Jesus says, here's what it means to follow me, he says, you go out there under the anointing of the Holy Spirit and cast out everything that looks to you like death. I mean, it's a recreation of the Passover when they would um, hide the yeast all over, the, you know, take, put, uh, excuse me, take out the yeast everywhere in the house. They go looking for every single crumb. You know why? Because the Egyptians um, were the ones who first invented fermented bread. And the Egyptians, their Bible was the book of death. The Egyptians represented for the Israelites everything that death breeds. And so when Jesus tells his followers, you go out and you look for signs of death and you cast out death and call forth light, what he's saying is, we are getting, we are no longer stuck in Egypt. We are no longer slaves. Tell your friends, tell somebody next to you, I am no longer a slave. Tell them, I am no longer a slave. Now turn to your friend again and say, well, then stop acting like it. <laughs> so John, uh, Luke chapter 9, Herod, a government leader, the one who had John the Baptist killed, hears about this movement and these miracles, and he's perplexed. Herod is a power monger who is jealous of the movement. So the story in Acts 12 tells us that eventually Herod would persecute believers widely. Having James, the the brother of John, not James for whom the book of the Bible is written, put to death and Peter imprisoned, clearly Herod had an issue with Christians. Herod's paragraph in chapter 9, verses 7 to 9, reminds us of two things. First, the enemy is always lurking. And second, no amount of effort can kill a kingdom movement. So will you let that cure you of a little bit of anxiety? You've not just preached your last sermon. You're not, your ministry is not on its way downhill toward death. If it's a kingdom movement, nothing can kill it. Nothing. In fact, some of you are just a couple of funerals away from having a really great church. Am I right? Am I right? (laughs) 
first miracle in Luke chapter 9, verse 10, is a feeding miracle. A miracle, by definition, is something that happens rarely, but I believe Jesus uses this opportunity to let his disciples practice their newly received power and authority. When they wonder how these thousands of people are going to eat, Jesus says, you give them something to eat. The implication is that they've seen Jesus, uh, this, this power they've seen Jesus wield is now theirs to use for kingdom purposes, for the sake of revealing the kingdom of God. So after the miracle, there's a declaration. Jesus asks his followers, Luke 9, 18, to tell him what the crowds are saying about, the, about him. They talk in third person for a few minutes, then Jesus gets personal. He says, no, 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 no. Who do you say that I am? And Peter, a Jewish man, says perhaps for the first time, you are God's Messiah. So now we have a feeding miracle followed by a proclamation, and that gives us the pattern of first century evangelism. Miracle and proclamation, wonder and word. This combination turns information into transformation. It makes the good news supernatural. But it is only good news if Jesus has conquered sin and death, right? So the next section of Luke chapter 9 is critical, and it's all red letters. I love red letters. I love red letters. It's Jesus' response to Peter's proclamation. Peter's just declared his faith in God's Messiah, and now Jesus, listen, now Jesus declares his faith in God's Messiah. Think about that for a minute. As a human, Jesus also had to believe that what God called Messiah is actually Messiah, even if it's sitting inside his own body. He had to have faith while he stood on earth. So Jesus tells them that in order for the news to be eternally good, the Son of Man must suffer. And followers, likewise, must take up a cross. And that is how glory reveals itself. Glory is not what you think it is. You think it's fairy dust. Glory isn't fairy dust. Glory is when you feel like you have been crushed into dust, but you can still get up and keep going under the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's where the transformation happens. Uh, Transfiguration. Transfiguration in Luke chapter 9. They go up on this hill. Glory reveals itself through the appearance of Moses and Elijah. These two great first covenant prophets stand and talk to Jesus as Peter, John, and James look on. And the story says, verse 32, when, and here's the whole thing, the whole thing right here. When they became fully awake, they saw his glory. Come on. Come on. If there's somebody sitting next to you who's sleeping right now. (laughs) When they became fully awake, they saw his glory. When they became fully awake, they saw his glory. Which is to say, it is possible that if you have not seen his glory, you are not fully awake to the wonders of God. I am so exposed by that line. (laughs) I recognize myself in the state of Jesus' disciples. I have to admit, I am often the last person in the room to know when the Holy Spirit has fallen. I can still miss Jesus when he shows up. Because I'm checking my mic, wondering what time is. I know I'm alone in that, but I'm just telling you what it's like for me. (laughs) What am I missing because I am not fully awake. If I'm not seeing God's glory, is it because God's glory is absent or is it because I am trotting through life half asleep just trying to make it to to Sunday afternoon at one o'clock? Thomas Merton says, the gate of heaven is everywhere. Only those who are fully awakened spiritually will recognize the open gates, pass through them and experience the glory of God. Being awakened begins with changing your spiritual, not just your spiritual demeanor, but your spiritual location. 
when they became fully awake. Listen to what Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 7. He says, because, it, it, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. He awakened us. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ. Hear that, verse, what is that, 6? God raised us up. This is past tense. God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Experientially, folks, this is possibly the most important principle in Christianity because we cannot get where we want to go until we understand that in some very mysterious but real way, we are already seated with Christ in the heavens. Paul speaks past tense. Dr. Steve Siemens of Asbury Seminary is the first person who turned me on to this thought. It only took me about 10 years to get it. Not the brightest bulb in the seminary box. So often we come at life from the bottom up. As if, we're, as if we're fighting to get up there where Jesus is. But Paul tells us, we're already up there. You are already up there. You are already up there. And we are invited to view all of life from this perspective. Friends, you got a box seat. You've got a box seat. It's like the difference between being tossed in the ring alone with a heavyweight boxer and being seated in a box seat surrounded by bodyguards. You're, num you're the second option in that if you've claimed all the power of Jesus and trust yourself as being already seated in the heavenlies. We have been given this secure place from which to experience life and it ought to change the way we view everything. Hear me, friends, in Christ, you are already loved. You are already accepted. You are already forgiven. You are already justified. Paul says God has already raised us up in Christ, seated us with him in the heavenlies in Christ in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace and the great kindness of Jesus. You are not someone trying to jump up to be good enough for Jesus to love you. You are sitting in the bleachers with him, sharing popcorn in, in, a, in a beautiful vantage point from which to see the end unfold. Come on, folks. It means all your big questions have been answered. We're already proven. We are welcome to go ahead and embrace the peculiarity of the spirit-filled life. Yes. Peter says, the same one, he's questioning this whole thing before he becomes fully, I believe that, I think Peter got a lot smarter when he became fully awake. <laughs> As you notice, there's a big shift there all of a sudden. By the time you get to 1st and 2nd Peter, he's talking like a deep-end theologian. And he says this, 1st Peter chapter 2, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. I love that, God's special possession. Uh, in, in the King James Version, it's you are a peculiar people. But the New King James and NIV have cleaned it up. You are special. <laughs> I want to say to you, you are strange. <laughs> Especially if you're a Christian in Seattle. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, a real Christian is never going to look like the rest of the world. Never. We are peculiar people. We are people who love profoundly. 
who hang on way past good sins, who believe the Holy Spirit uses odd people to advance the kingdom of God. Real Christians have the audacity to believe we are able to do the works Jesus did, and in fact, greater works than those. We think serving other people is more fun than being served, and in fact, God will show up when we do. We believe we are at our best when we are broken and poured out. We believe the God of the universe wants our partnership and that if we want to, we can welcome and advance the kingdom of God. We believe we are becoming more like Jesus every day and that one day Jesus is coming home again and we'll look for peculiar people who look a lot like him. The sooner you embrace the fact that you're just plain strange, you are odd, you are never gonna be un-odd. The sooner you embrace that fact, the, the, the more fun your life will get. <laughs> I'll tell you, you know, I didn't come at this, I, I, I grew up in United Methodist. Mainline United Methodist Church, we never mentioned Jesus, except, you know, when you're talking about the Trinity, then only, um, then only academically, we never mentioned the Holy Spirit. It was just that one weird guy who'd gotten touched by something who held his hands up in the middle of worship. Nobody else knew anything about the Holy Spirit. When I went to seminary, I didn't know anything about the Holy Spirit. The God just kind of pushed me in. So some years into this church plant, my, you know, I'm, 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 I'm shucking off the old life, pulling on the new, so interested, but I don't know what I'm doing. I, I, I'd gone through a fast, 21-day fast. I mean, like a real 21-day fast. I fasted for 21 days. At the end of that, you're a little lightheaded, you know, but life is good. It's one of the top spiritual experiences of my life. About a week after that, I mean, I'm, I'm still flying. Uh, about a week after that fast ended, um, somebody invites me to a spirit-filled Christian, invites me to a full gospel businessmen's meeting at the Golden Corral. <laughs> Not natural to my experience, but I'm just lightheaded enough to go. So I go, and you know, I don't know, do they have a Golden Corral out here? You know, they, you know when they have a, a lunch meeting, they pull that little, um, that little uh, partition to, to, so you're separated from the men's room, and it's right, it's right on the other side of the partition. I go, I go to the Golden Corral with her. Some guy from South America, evangelist from South America speaks. He's fine, it's nothing, you know, I'm not blown over or anything. Get to the end and she says, don't you want him to pray for you? And I'm like, oh, okay, he didn't pray for me, it's fine. He walks over to me, he, he does nothing. He doesn't touch me, he starts speaking to me and he just very gently starts speaking prophetically and I just, bam, go down. Now I have to say, by this time, most everybody in the, in the room had already left, they pulled the partition back. I am, I am 25 feet from the men's bathroom in the Golden Corral, the first time I ever got slain in the spirit. I'm going down and I'm thinking, no, 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 I don't know, no, 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 I don't know what's on this floor. I don't know what's on this floor. Other patrons are walking by going, what's she eat? I don't want to touch that. And I hear God say to me, you can get up if you want to. But if you do, I can't promise where you're going to be the next time this happens. <laughs> so I stayed there. Some years before that, I'd had a guy pray over me to receive the Holy Spirit. And he said to me, you're not gonna feel anything, but I want you to get up from here, walk out, and walk in the Spirit. Believe it by faith. I'd have to say that that prayer some years before, and that moment on the floor of the Golden Corral were exactly the same thing. You get up from there, and you walk out with whatever God has given you, and you trust it, and you just give in. I am never gonna look like everybody else. I am now a person who has a story about falling out in the Golden Corral. <laughs> you can't undo that. You can't undo it. What I want to say to you today is this. 
God wants to do a new thing in your life. God wants to do a new thing. When they came fully awake, they saw his glory. Isaiah 43, 19 to 21 says, see, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness, streams in the wasteland. The wild animals honor me, the jackals and the owls, because I provide water in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people, my chosen, my chosen my people I formed for myself that they may proclaim my praise. I have to believe that's where Jesus was when he stood up before his disciples one day and said to them, let anyone who is thirsty come to me to, to drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from them. And John says, by this he meant the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the spirit had not yet been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. That time has now come. Yes. Jesus has been glorified. And if Jesus has been glorified, then when you become fully awake, you also can see his glory. He gave them. He gave them power and authority to cast out demons and cure disease, proclaim the kingdom, and heal the sick. And if you're going to cast out demons, it will take more than mental assent to a set of, fa a set of facts. So Luke takes us immediately from the mountaintop experience down into the valley with, to a boy with a demon, what others consider horror, Jesus considers an aggravation. In this scene, he embodies the truth. Greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. And then he reminds them again, there is no power without this promise. He tells them, verse 44, the Son of Man will be delivered into the hands of men. If he is not greater than the threat of death, we have nothing. Do you hear me? If he is not greater than the threat of death, we have nothing. Some of you today need to deal with your fear of death. The one who's in you is greater. Our best days are way in front of us. I'm trying to decide where I want to go. Mm -hmm. Here's where I want to go. You remember that old childhood song, Hokey Pokey? I think that's, you know, we talk about prayer in schools being when our country went downhill. I think we went downhill when we told children to put on a pair of roller skates and then stand on one foot. I th whoever thought of that is a special kind of demented. But here's what the Hokey Pokey gets right. When you're putting your left foot in and taking your left foot out, you are unstable. It is hard and exhausting to have yourself in two different places at one time. When you're putting your whole self in, then turning around and taking your whole self out, that's tough, not just on you, but on everybody around you. When that's your plan, I'll be in until I'm uncomfortable. You never get beyond the two-foot radius of yourself. But this isn't the ultimate point of our healing. God came to save the world, not just our corner of it. We are healed for the sake of others, for the sake of our city, for the sake of our country, for the sake of the world. And that kind of work, friends, requires us to be all in. So I know, how many people in here are actually pastors? I mean, I hope I'm talking to most people in the room. Okay, I'm talking to pastors right now because I have played hokey pokey for years. I am in, I am good, life is wonderful, right up until the moment that half the people show up on a Sunday morning and I forgot it was Labor Day so I didn't count on that and my whole 
everything falls apart. I go home and I say, Jesus, I am not cut out for this. You can't do this to me anymore. Everything depends for me on the attendance of Sunday morning. What an idol that is. What an idol. Where everything depends on whether my staff team is doing great work or demon possessed. <laughs> One of the questions John Wesley asked of people getting ordained into the Methodist ministry was this, are you resolved to devote yourselves wholly to God and his work? You should write that down. Are you resolved to devote yourselves wholly to God's work? I mean, that's like the anti-hokey pokey question. When Wesley asked this question of his pastors, he wanted to know if the people who resolve to be church leaders are all in, or if they plan to put their left foot in and then take it out when things get rough, or put it in when they agree, and take it out when they disagree, because those folks who cannot be all in, they not only exhaust themselves, they exhaust us. So if the only option open to us is wholeheartedness, being wholly devoted to God and His Word, how do we know we have it? What's the litmus test for wholeheartedness? What does it mean to become whole by biblical standards? Purely, it begins with Paul's advice to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Stay in it, Paul advises. Wrestle with what it looks like in your life. Let that daily wrestling expose the cracks in the wounds. But recognize no matter how whole you get, you will always be peculiar. <laughs> if you carry the Spirit of Christ, how could you be anything else? Yeah. When the Holy Spirit is deposited into us, we become tabernacles of God. We connect to that identity by faith. It's, it's a gift from God, gifts to be guarded, held as holy, to be honored even when they put us at odds with the world around us. Chosen people, royal priesthood, holy nation, God's special people. When we do it right, friends, it will be uncomfortable. You were called to this. You know, there's a, the end of chapter nine, there's these three, there's these three little scenes where uh, Jesus invites people to come with him. And their response all three time, it, times is, but first. I'll come, but first. I, I'm, in, I'm all in, just, but first. Let me bury my father, but first. Let me say goodbye to my family. But first, let me get all my finances in order. <laughs> but first, I need to get my children in order and make sure my children are taken care of. Because I don't think Jesus can take care of my children. <laughs> but first, I want to say to you, there is no but first in the kingdom of God. <laughs> there is just go. So all of Luke chapter 9 dumps out into the first verses of Luke chapter 10 where he says, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him into every town and place where he was about to go. And he told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. And then this two-word sledgehammer, I mean, two-letter two, two, uh, letter sledgehammer, go, go. You are called to this. Now, go, take authority, trust the power, preach the gospel, heal the sick, deliver people of their demons. There is no shortage of people who need to be delivered from demons. No shortage. The fields are full of them, Jesus says. There are fields full of people, I want to ask you to stand up, who are desperately in need of someone who will claim the power of Christ over their broken lives. Fields full of people 
whose salvation story has yet to be, to be told. There are billions of people out there who still have not been reached, who more than anything need a fair account of the gospel and a generous dose of grace. So please, friends, do not forget you, who you are. You are a child of God. You are a child of the most Hi, God, a follower of Jesus who has been given power and authority to cast out all demons, to cure all diseases, to proclaim the kingdom, and to heal the sick. And I'm telling you right now, this morning, you can decide for your ministry, for your family, for your place in your church, you will no longer be satisfied with third person stories of other places where people are making it happen that you've never been to, people you've never seen. You can decide right now, Jesus, I will only be satisfied with first person stories. And I'm going to tell you, I believe it happens when you decide right now to just get on your knees. You come into the river. The river is the, the aisles. The river is up here. You come in and you get on your knees right now and say that, and I'm telling you now, come in. Come into the river. Yeah. You come in. You oh, come God. in right now. You come into the river. Jesus says, I will pour streams through your desert. If there's not room enough where you are, come up on the stage. Yeah. This would be your opportunity. Come all the way up on the stage. You come in.